Let's pray together. And in the quietness of this moment, as we have worshiped the Lord, and we've told him how much we love him for dying for us on the cross, we said it is finished. The battle's over. Would you thank God for that right now? Now would you confess anything that you have in your heart uh, before the Lord and ask him to get you ready to hear the word of God. Father, we pray that you would anoint this time as you already have. Lord, we sense your presence here. We've invited you to come for the song, Holy Spirit, that's so wonderfully done. And we've cried out, it is finished, and we celebrate what you have done for us. And the battle, that battle's over, and yet we still fight a battle to grow in you. I pray, God, that things will be said today to help us win that battle as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a seat, and we take our Bibles this morning, and we want to turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, and we're going to talk about spiritual growth today. And Henry Ford, um, who necessarily, wasn't necessarily talking about spiritual growth, but he said this, before anything else, getting ready is the secret to success. So God wants to do something great in your life. And the question is, this morning, are you ready for that? Are you prepared for that? You know, I, I spoke just a few moments ago about football season uh, coming upon us now and in full, in full swing of things. And uh, your, your favorite team maybe won or did not win yesterday. But here's the thing. It used to be in, in, in football, you had spring practice, and then you had fall practice, and then you played the game. But now our teams, our college teams at least, they have workouts in January and February. Then they have spring practice. Then they have summer workouts that were, quote, unquote, led by the players. And then they have fall camp for about a month. And then they practice all during the week, all for those 12 games that they play during the season because it, there, there's so much on the line. We think, well, it's just a game, but for them, it's a, li a future livelihood, perhaps. It's certainly alumni feeling proud of their team. It also uh, makes a big difference in donations to the college. And so there, there's something besides just a game on the line. But the point is this. In order for them to win, in order for them to succeed, in order for them to make the difference on the field, they've got to be prepared. Now, we've heard a lot of this stuff about... Uh, uh, lives that matter and that we're in a series of messages on living a life that matters you know you you come out and you you know that on the news you hear about black lives matter and then somebody else says well all lives matter and so you hear a lot of talking about this but let me say this all lives matter to god Amen. with that being said whether your life really matters or not and makes a difference or not is it, really up to you and how you're going to invest your life and spend your life well, we've been in a series of messages on living a life that matters, and our, our uh, theme or our, our vision statement says this, building lives that matter. We are building lives that matter by leading people into a growing, growing relationship with Christ. Now, we have the baseball diamond once again, and last three weeks we've been talking about first base. We've been talking about reaching. Now we're going to be talking about teaching. What do you need to know? I remember when I was a young Christian at the age of 16, and I was already in a small group class, so I was already getting a little growth from that, but nobody told me how to grow. Nobody. And you say, well, yeah, but a lot of things are just common sense. Not to a young Christian. I just didn't know. And so for three years, I sort of wandered around a little bit and just a baby in Christ, and I wasn't really growing in the Lord. There was a survey taken not too long ago, and it said that 95% of Christians did not really know what it took to really grow in the Lord. And so if you can just imagine yourself on a 1 to 10 scale right now, and 1 being a real baby in Christ and 10 being a, um, a really certified, mature Christian, where are you on that scale right now? Where are you? And then I want to ask you the question, where, do you, where should you be? Now, when I say that, everybody says, oh, I ought to be a 10. No, you, you can't always be a 10. I tell you why, because I'm going to give you Real quickly, five things, truths about growth. Number one, it's not automatic. Number two, it's a process. It's step by step. Number three, it takes time. You just don't simply become a 10 overnight. It takes time to do it. It takes knowledge, and it takes motivation. 
And so as we look to Luke chapter 5 today, we looked last week at the Lordship of Christ, and we said one key element of that was simply the, that verse where it said, pick up your cross daily and follow Christ. That word, follow him. What does it take to follow Christ? Now, I want you to think about the Christian life as being just that, about step by step following Christ, because that's how we grow as a Christian. It is not all at once. It is, it is not zero to 60 in five seconds. It's a step by step process as we're looking at Luke chapter 5. We read the passage. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is really the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, this is Simon Peter, and asked him, to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let your nets down for the catch. Then, I want you to notice over in uh, verse 11, when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Now we look at those last few words. We think, wow, how in the world can a person do that? They just left everything. Talk about the Lordship of Christ. Talk about giving him, you might say, the, the key to every single room in the house all at one time. Boy, these were committed people. But even then, there was a process that we're going to look at in just a moment. But what does it mean when we're talking about following him and about growing? What I'm going to look at four questions today. Why should we grow? Number two, how do we grow? Number three, what are the tools? And number four, what is the next step that you and I need to take? I remember, as we look at why we should grow, I remember um, being a seminary student and riding with this uh, fellow to work every day by the name of Don Broker. Don became a pastor up in the Michigan area for many, many years uh, after graduation. And so we're riding to uh, work, and he asked the question of all of us there in the car, why should I grow? Now, he knew really the answer, sort of, but he really wanted to know why we should grow. I mean, after all, once a person receives Christ into their heart, they are adopted into the family of God. We'll never lose that salvation. And so if we're not going to lose the salvation, and, uh, and we're already going to go to heaven, our ticket's already been punched, then why worry about growing? Because when we get to heaven, we're going to be like Christ anyway. Well, I think, I think that's a legitimate question. What motivates us to do that? Well, notice here in chapter 5 that, Jesus, that Peter was a man who was a profane fisherman, and then later he would become a great man of God. In fact, he was the one who preached the, the sermon, the main sermon at least, on the day of Pentecost. And so what happens to us? At the very moment you and I receive Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit within our life. And that Holy Spirit changes our motivation in life. So one of the reasons why we need to grow is because we want to. A Christian just simply wants to grow. But what's the goal? Romans 8, 29 says this. Paul said, for those whom he did foreknow, those who in his foreknowledge he knew they would be saved, he also predestined or preplanned them to become conformed to the image of his son. And so what is God's will for your life and mine? God's will for your life and mine is that we would be conformed, that is changed over in a gradual way, more and more to the image of Jesus Christ. Really, it's saying, in essence, to be like Jesus Christ. Now, here is one of the biggest objections to spiritual growth, whether you realize it or not. I'm about to give you one of the main reasons why we are not motivated. The main, one of the main reasons is simply this. We think we've really got enough. We have enough. You see, most Christians think they're almost... They're almost there to rescue themselves. They think, wow, you know, I grew up in a Christian home. I was raised in church, baptized in church. I, I was in a small group growing up, and I just needed a little extra for Jesus Christ to come into my heart and, and save me. In other words, what we think is that we think Jesus is here to make good people better. Now, you say, well, I know that's not scriptural, Pastor, and I don't believe that. But if you were to check your life out, you would understand what I'm saying. There's a tendency for that. 
You know, we look at other people. Well, I'm not a prisoner. You know, I, I'm not getting out of prison here. And, and I don't beat my wife, and I don't beat my husband, you know, whatever. And uh, I don't do all these things that, that every, everybody else does. You know, I don't have, uh, you know, I, I don't look like my face has just fallen into a tackle box, you know. I don't look that way. I'm, I'm just this, this good person here that is just really, I just, I needed a Savior. I admit that, but I was almost there to save myself. But when you look at society today, you would see a movement, hard movement towards sin and what's acceptable in our society. I was watching one of the news programs a couple of weeks ago, and this guy that was really a conservative commentator was saying, and he was talking about the, uh, the gay marriage issue, and he says, well, I just can't understand. He said, why in the world? I, and he really didn't get it. He says, I just don't understand why these people are even talking about a heterosexual couple living together without the benefit of marriage. What is that all about? What, what's the protest to that? But yet, you know and I know, 20 years ago, that, that, was, that was not acceptable at all. I remember when Three's Company, anybody remember, remember that show, Three's Company? You know, they were just, they were living together, but it was, a, um, um, it was just simply a friendship relationship. Nothing was going on. But even that was scandalous. Well, that today is on Nick at Night. And so what, what's your point, Pastor? My point is this. The only difference between the guy getting out of prison, really, and us, is the respectability of our sins. That's it. And until we come to the point of realizing that being saved is not about getting better. It's not making a good person, a pretty good person, better. Therefore, I'm better. Now, now look, I've received Jesus, and I'm better. How much better can I get? Why do I need to grow anymore? I'm already here. I've already, kind of, I've already kind of arrived. And therefore, we're not motivated to grow because we have respectable sins. But the Bible says that we are born again when we receive the Spirit of God. Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so here's the picture that the Bible gives, which is the truth, right? Everybody agree with that? No, the Bible's the truth. The Bible says we all come to the cross with, with non-respectable sins as far as God is concerned. Now, different sins have different ramifications and different, different consequences to it. I'm not arguing that. But the Bible says in order to get us lost, we need to sin one time. If we sin one time, we need a Savior just as badly as anyone else needs a Savior. So the Savior comes into our heart. We are instantly born again. And so what does that mean? What is the imagery here? The imagery is, I'm a baby. When I came to know Christ, I came to the cross just like everybody else. I was a sinner, desperate for a Savior, for a rescuer. Jesus rescued me. Then I was in the same boat again in which I was a baby in Christ. And so some of us, perhaps, have been saved for 20 years and still a baby in Christ. You say, well, I'm a baby in Christ. I'm going to go to heaven. What's the motivation there to really growing? Well, think about this. A baby is unstable emotionally. Don't you agree? Why, why I cry? Here's an ice cream. Okay. I mean, what, what's that all about? I mean, they're crying, they're crying. All you, just give them a piece of candy and, and they're well. A baby is selfish, right? I want what I want when I want it, and I, I'm not really having any regard for your feelings at all as a parent. A baby is not wise. As soon as a baby begins to walk, what happens, guys, in the home? All of a sudden, you have to what? To your house. Baby-proof it. Thank you. You have to baby-proof your house. I've told you the story before about one of my boys um, when we were moving from Fort Worth, Texas to um, Atlanta, Georgia. The house was, as it was, a small house. It was empty of all furniture. We just had, we saved the Audubon back so my, uh, my boy, my young son, could pull himself up on it as he wasn't walking quite as yet. And so we were doing a lot of things, and he was just sort of sitting around there playing. And I noticed something in his mouth. And I walked over, and he had a, the double-edged razor blade that had popped out of the razor cutting, uh, the box cutter. It was in his mouth. And immediately, I looked alarmed, of course, 
and, and put my fingers on it. He opened up, I just said, open up your mouth. And I had no idea how he understood me, but he did that, and I pulled it out without cutting him. Now, the point is, he didn't know that was bad. I know of uh, one couple, as soon as their um, little daughter started walking, she walked out into traffic, and he had to run out and get her. Babies are unstable emotionally, they're, they're selfish, and they're not wise. They can't figure out anything. They certainly can't figure out what God wants them to do. They can't even figure out what you want them to do most of the time. And so this is a picture of how we are as babes in Christ. Now, the Bible talks in 1 John about, about babies in Christ, young men in Christ, older people in Christ, and it's talking about the maturity process that we grow through. So we grow to be more like Jesus Christ. Now, if I'm more like Jesus Christ, if I'm growing and becoming closer and closer to Christ, and also becoming more like him, what happens to my life? I become wiser because Jesus was the wisest person to ever live. It says in James 1, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God well, gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it shall be given to him. And so I'm going to get more wisdom to know what God wants me to do with my life. I'm going to have more faith. The Bible says, look, if you're going to please God, you've got to, you've got to do it by believing that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In other words, we got to believe God's good. We talked about that last week. And every time we come to a door and open it up for the Lordship of Christ to take over that room in our life, we're declaring God is good. Well, every time we take a step, no matter if it's a step in the dark, a step on a creaky step, if we're unsure about it, what we're saying is, God, I trust you because you are good. And so it's going to increase our faith. And we're going to become closer to God. The Bible says this in Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life, and your presence is fullness of joy. In the right hand, there are pleasures forever. So we're going to have more joy in our life. We're going to have, be more like Christ. We're going to have better relationships. We talked about a couple of weeks ago how it all starts off with a peace of God in our heart. Once we have the peace of God in our own heart, in our tranquility, we're going to have peace with others. We're going to have peace on the outside as well as the inside. At least we have an opportunity for that. And without the, the, um, uh, the peace on the inside, we are not going to be at peace with those around us. And finally, and this, could be an this is not an exhaustive list. I could go on and on. You're just more mature. You're more mature. James says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials Knowing the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You can become more mature in Christ. You know, you're know you going to know what to do. You, you're going to know God's will more. You're going to know your, your, your purpose in life better. You're going to be able to relate to those around you better. You're going to be able to take life and endure life so much better as a growing Christian who is maturing in the Lord. And so, what's the process? Well, let's look at our passage in Luke 5, because we have a tendency to think that all of a sudden, boom, you know, Jesus shows up, they drop their nets, and they, and they follow. But I want you to notice the process. First one, it says, they were listening to the Word of God. They, were, they first heard Jesus teaching that was the first thing they heard. They heard it right there on the shore, and that was it. That's all they were doing. And suddenly Jesus said, well, let's take the next step. And he says, I want to borrow your boat. Look down in verse uh, 3. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way into the land. I want to borrow your boat. Just another step. He didn't say, I, I'm the son of God, and I want you to come and follow me. He just said, I, I want to borrow your boat. And so they go out. And he bars the boat. And then the next thing in verse 4, he wants him to take another step. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Oh, a, little bit, a little bit more faith taken here because, I mean, after all, Peter is the fisherman. Now, he could have looked at Jesus and said, now, aren't you a carpenter or something? Uh, I mean, do you know anything about fishing at all? We've been fishing all night. We've been fishing all night and caught nothing. Now, you fish, that's what you did. You fished at night, and they were commercial fishermen, so they would have nets. They were bringing the catch. They would sell it the next morning at the marketplace or to, they were the kind of a wholesaler to all the people, the retailers there in the marketplace. 
And so they've come in and they, they had nothing. Now this is a whole fishing crew. I can't imagine at the Sea of Galilee they would come home very often without a catch at all. But they had nothing. And it's like, hey, look, I think I know about fishing better than you do. And don't, aren't we challenged to take the next step? Sometimes we, we think to ourselves, God, I think I know better than you here. I've been here, done that before, and you know what happened then. But here he's just simply taking a next step. Then he says in, in verse 5, Simon answered and said, Master, we worked all night, et cetera, et cetera, verse 6, and when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break, so they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats, so they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Here was a man who suddenly realized who Jesus was and who he was. He discovered the sin in his own life. And compared to Christ, as he looked at Christ for who he was for the very first time, he recognized his own sin. He was taking another step. And finally, they dropped all their nets and they began to follow the Lord. What's the process in your life? Maybe you're sitting here today and and you haven't been to church very often, and so your next step was simply to come to church, and you're sitting there, you're kind of laid back, you're kind of maybe hopefully enjoying things a little bit, and God's not asking you to maybe do anything else, just, just come, and that's it. And so maybe you come this Sunday, and next Sunday, and next Sunday, but sooner or later, he's going to say, can I borrow your boat? He's going to ask you to take the next step. I don't know what that is, but maybe consider the claims of Christ to listen as though it applied to you and listen to the fact that God, God is good, he's a good God, and he can be your master and your Lord. And then uh, maybe one day he asks you to take the next step, and that's to receive Christ in your heart. But it's one step at a time. And maybe as a Christian, he's telling you, look, you've been sitting in church, and what you need to do is you need to establish some relationships in small groups. Uh, or maybe your next step, you need to read the Bible. Maybe your next step, what you need to start doing is serving in some form in the body of Christ. One step at a time. And you're saying to you know, well, I don't know if I want to do all that. And God, Jesus said, just, just cast the nets. Trust me. Peter says, look, we've been, we've been fishing all night, but at your bidding, Lord, we'll throw it in. And Jesus said, just trust me. And they got a catch bigger than they've ever had before. They had to, the net started breaking. They had to call in people from the outside or their other friends from other boat, the other boat, and to help them because of what was going on, the blessing that they were having in their life. Maybe your next step is to treat maybe your wife as Christ treated the church. Maybe, lady, ma'am, your next step is to admire your husband and to treat him like, uh, you know, the Prince Charming in your life. He said, boy, if I do that, my, my wife will walk all over me. Jesus says, trust me. Well, if I do that, my husband will just treat me just awful. And Jesus says, trust me. He said, well, you know, if I, if, if I really took my next step, Pastor, my next step is to kind of tell my, all my customers all the truth. Well, if I do that, that would cost me a lot of sales. Jesus said, just, just trust me. We take one step at a time. It's like what I was saying about the Lordship of Christ. Yes, the Lordship of Christ is all at once. All at one time, we say to the Lord, all of my life belongs to you. The problem is we don't know about our own life, and we don't know about the life of Christ. And so the whole house belongs to the Lord, but then we take the keys to each room, and Jesus said, I want to look at that room, and we open it up and say, oh, it's a mess. It's the same thing in growth. You take the next step of obedience, the next step, because it's all about what? The key phrase, follow me. That's what it means to grow. Follow me. Just take the next step. Follow me. Take the next step. Follow me. And we just keep on taking those steps. And the steps that are vacated, you might say, by Jesus' steps, we just step into those footprints. All along the way, obeying him in this relationship with him. Now, what, what are some of the tools here? Third question, what are some of the tools? Now, we get very practical here because Christian growth is organic. It's not 
like a pile of rocks. You know, in order to grow a pile of rocks, you've got to do what? Somebody tell me. Yeah, you, got more, you need more rocks. You just throw more rocks on it. But for a plant to grow, you don't throw more plants on it. You nourish the plant and have that plant to grow. And Christian growth is organic, and you need three things. Very practical. If you have these three things, you will take step by steps and grow with the Lord. Number one, you need nourishment. Look in verse one, listening to the word of the Lord. Verse three, and he came about, came, rather, he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way for the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. Now, what was happening, he was teaching the people from the shore, but the crowd got so big that he got, kept getting pushed further and further toward the Sea of Galilee, and it really kind of drops off. There's no beach there. It's not really a sea. It's really a lake. And so he gets into the boat, and right there on the shore, I'm sure as the boat is tied in, it's anchored in, he begins to teach the people so they can't rush him and push him into the water. And so he's teaching them. The Word of God is the milk that we need to be nourished from. 1 Peter 2 says, Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the Word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. And by the way, there's a place in the Bible that talks about milk and meat, and that is for that passage. For this passage, Peter is saying this. The whole, every teaching from the Bible is just nourishment. That's the, that's the analogy here. That's the illustration. It's like milk to a baby because all of us are born babies in Christ. It's not that he's comparing deeper teaching to lighter teaching here. That's another passage. He's just saying, simply saying the milk of the Word of God. I'm gonna, I shared with you last week that I was going to give you one key to spiritual growth, and here it is. Here it is. You cannot grow without reading the Bible. You just can't. You say, well, wait a minute, you know, I, I've got a lot going on. You cannot grow without reading the Bible. And Jesus says, trust me, you just can't. But you don't understand, I've got, I got ball going on for the kids, I've got this going on, i got work. You cannot grow without reading the Bible. But there's TV shows, you know, there's, there's college football, and there's The View, and there's uh, Dancing with the Stars. You cannot grow without reading the Bible. You just can't. I don't care who you are, what you've done, where you've been, you cannot grow without the milk of the Word of God. So you're sitting here, and you're looking for some magic potion that I'm just going to give you, and then you're going to go home and boom, snap your fingers, zero to 60. You're going to be uh, growing in the Lord and you're going to be arrived tomorrow, by tomorrow. It's not going to happen because it's a process. It takes time. It takes the nourishment of the Word of God. And you come to church. And, and, and let me tell you, I know that more, less and less people are coming to church today. It, it's an epidemic all over America. People are just not seeing the need. And that is just the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my, in my entire life. But people that no longer go to church have left the Word of God a long time ago. Let me just share this with you, though. Just for those who come to church every Sunday, okay? This is your illustration. I remember when I was pastoring uh, my first church, Broad River Baptist Church in Baldwin, Georgia. Not actually in Baldwin. We were the country church of Baldwin, Georgia, and that town only had a few hundred people in it, and we were the country church, one of the country churches. Well, every day, as a single pastor, every Sunday, they would invite me to a big meal over at someone's house. Usually the same person, not always the same person. They would bring food in from everywhere. I mean, you know, the, the fried chicken, of course, was there, the gospel bird. You know, it's always there. And the banana pudding and all this kind of good stuff. And being a single guy, I look forward to this meal. And I would have home cooking for that meal, and I would eat. I, I'm not, you can see I don't miss too many meals. I would eat that meal. Well, what would it say? Hey, I'm satisfied. Man, I'm full. I can't even go out and play basketball or, or football with the youth today. I'm just so full. Well, by that evening, chances are I'm going to be hungry again. By the next day, I'm going to be very hungry. And by Tuesday or Wednesday, I'm going to be extremely hungry. And if I did that every week, where I, I went and, and had one big meal on Sunday, 
and I never ate the rest of the week. Not, not one morsel of food that I could digest. I would become a person in bad health. I wouldn't be growing, I would be declining in my uh, physical health. But we treat church that way. Well, I go, to, I go to small group and then I go to church and then the rest of the week I just don't get the Bible. The Bible, we cannot grow without reading the Bible. It's a, the Bible says, your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. It reveals Christ to us. It grows our faith. We say without faith it's impossible to please God. Those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is rewarded to those who diligently seek him. Now, everybody here wants more answer to prayer. Everybody here wants to endure the trials. Everyone here wants to have joy in the midst of all the junk you're going through in life. Everybody here wants to have faith that when you pray, God's going to do something miraculous. We all want that. How do we grow that faith? Now, faith, it's true it's a gift of God, but it's a gift that just keeps on giving. You can get more and more and more and more of it. How do you know that? Well, the Bible says so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You get it from the Bible. And the Bible tells us this, and let me just read the rest of 1 Peter, uh, those two verses. Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness or the goodness of the Lord. The word of God teaches us God is good. And if God is good, then every time as I'm reading the Bible and I'm growing step by step by step by step, when I come to those rooms and God says, okay, now I want to take over and become master of this area of your life, you're going to be able to open the door and you're going to be able to say, well, God, just go in and clean house. But if you're not in the word, you're going to be thinking, I don't know if God's good or not. I think I'm going to have to, to take this room to myself. God, I don't even want to look in that room. I'm going to ignore that room. I'm just going to ignore it like it's not even there because of a blind spot in your life. I'm not even going to look at it because I'm not sure if I'm going to be better off trusting you than going my own way. It's the Word of God that teaches us faith. But secondly, you not only need nourishment, you need acceptance. A little tougher here. You need acceptance of what's going on. Here Peter had been fishing all night, and I'm sure he was pretty disgusted because he had caught nothing. Don't you feel that way in life sometimes? You work and you work and you catch nothing. I mean, there's nothing there. And you think, God, I, I've been good. I've done this. I've done this. I'm going to church. I'm reading my Bible occasionally. I'm, I'm praying. And God, it just seems like you, you just never really put, place me in a place where I'm going to be happy. And we said there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness depends on something happening. And I've had very few days in my life, really, that I've been, quote, unquote, happy. There's been many days that I've had joy in spite of the circumstances. But we have to have an acceptance. What, what do we mean by an acceptance? I mean that, and I'm going to make a statement here, and, and some of you are going to have to think about this. But the chances are about 99.9, .9, maybe 100%, really, that you are exactly where you need to be today. Say, now wait a minute. Pastor, um, I'm going through this suffering and I've lost this and I'm, there's my health and there's my job. The chances, if you're, for example, if you're following the Lord, nothing can happen to you unless God allows it. So he's placed you in a position to grow. You see, we grow through interior pressure, that's the Bible, and we grow through exterior pressure, the trials of life. Romans 5 puts it this way. And not only this, but we also exalt or have joy in tribulations, that is the trials in our life, knowing that these trials bring about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character, proven character hope, and hope being poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit was given to us. So it all ends up in hope, which is future faith. We believe God in a greater way, have a better character with the trials that we're going through. Now, what if you've made decisions out of the will of God? Good question. My premise to you is, chances are, you're exactly where you need to, need to be right now. Because if you were, had been following the Lord, you wouldn't be in the place 
where you are today. And the reason you didn't follow the Lord is because you didn't trust him, that he wasn't good enough, and he wasn't great enough. And he, wasn't gonna, he didn't love you enough. And so you made your own decision. Now, if you've done that, then you need to be where you are right now in order to get repentance of that and to open up that door and the lordship of your life and allow God to clean out that area of your life. If you'd made the right decision, you'd never be at the place where you are today. So God can even use the sin in your life to bring you to a point of humility and humbleness and, and um, joy in the Lord because you're trusting him. Have you received it today? Have you received it? Say, God, you know, I've dug, I've dug my own grave, you might say, but the reason I'm here in this hole, in this ditch, in this sinkhole, God, is because I placed myself here, and you can use this. I'm exactly where I need to be because if I wasn't here, I wouldn't be in church. If I wasn't here... I wouldn't be bringing to myself to the point of repentance in my life. I wouldn't be following you. And there's others that are not in the same call at all. And you look and say, God, I've done this, 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 and this. Dear friend, know this, that if you're following the Lord, if you're t taking step by step with him, then know that you are where God wants you to be as you mature in him and minister to other people that have gone through what you've gone through. And you say, well, I just don't accept that. Well, what you're saying then is God is not good. You see, when I, when I complain, and I do, and when I whine, and I have, I'm just saying, God, you know, I just don't think you're that good. I just can't trust you. And all the while he's saying, just accept it, just accept it, just accept it. I tell you, um, when I um, first looked at being called as a pastor here, it was hard for me to accept it. I was leading, leaving a place that I loved to come to a place, you know, sort of the old saying, I was leading a place of people who loved me to come to a place where they love their last pastor. Does that make sense? I think everybody, everybody does that. And so God took me sort of almost kicking and screaming, but at the same time, it wasn't rebellion. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't discern the will of God because of how I felt there. But I said, God, I don't know what you want me to do, but just make me do what you want me to do. Accept it. But then, lastly, and I need to hurry with this, relationship. Three things that you need. You need nourishment to grow. You need acceptance to grow. You need relationship to grow. Relationship with God and prayer. Many of you have already seen the movie War Room. And I tell you, that really convicted me because I realized that the church, it's not so much that the church is not getting answers to prayer, the church isn't praying, not like they were praying. You need a relationship with others. You can't grow alone. The Bible says iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We'll be talking about that in a couple of weeks. Talking about church small groups, the give and take uh, of, uh, of conflict in our life. Now, the problem is when we... we walk through the lordship of Christ, and we refuse to even look at this door. God, you know, I'm not even going to pay attention to that because there's nothing wrong with that area of my life. We call that a blind spot. And the reason it's a blind spot, the reason it's so strong in your life is because you never deal with it. And you need other people in your life that you trust that will help you deal with it. And it needs to be somebody besides your husband or your wife. It needs to be somebody else. Now, most of the time, in small groups even, but certainly in a church of this size, you know, we, we look at it, it's sort of like looking at your picture. You know, you've done this before. You, you look at the picture and say, wow, that, that, well, that's an ugly picture of me. Man, I just can't believe I'm, I'm that ugly. How many have ever done that before besides me, you know? And what, what is a, a kind of a friend going to do? Oh, that's a good picture of you. But, well, yeah. but yeah, you do look better than that. Now, a true friend would say, no, you're just that fat and ugly. That's you. You know, that is you. In fact, that might be, that may be look a little bit better than you really look. <laughs> if it's going to help you. If it's going to help you. The problem is we don't have those kind of friends in our life because we have invested in the lives of others. So what next? What do you need to do? I, I got to close. Looking, I need to skip, over, skip down to verse 10. So they were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you'll be catching men. 
Why did he have to say that? Do not fear. He had to say that a lot. Do not fear. Why do you have to say that? Because Peter was afraid. He was afraid. We're afraid because as we take that next step, it's like it's a step into the dark. If there was light on the path, if there was light way down the path, then anybody would go. Because as you look down the path, you think, wow, you know, this doesn't look good right now, this next step, but wow, it's going to really look good down the road. I, I, of course I'm going to follow this. No, it's a step of faith. That's why it's a, the next step has light. The next step after that does not have light until you take the step. There's always a step into the dark. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Trust me. Don't be afraid, God. I'm not afraid. Help me to not be afraid. There's one pastor that uh, was telling a story. And as he raised his boys, he raised them to do kind of uh, don't be afraid of anything. So he'd make them almost do daring things for their age a little bit in order to, uh, to instill some courage within them to try things. And so they were going to go white water rafting. And they were, I don't know if you've ever done this or not, but you get into a truck and you put all the outfit on and you put the, uh, uh, what is it, life, life preserver on. You already got that on. And, and now you're sitting in, in this truck and bus and, and you're riding to, the, to the, where the waves are, where the rafting starts. And um, as they were going along, his son, about 10 years old, looked at him and said, Daddy, I'm not going to want to do this. I'm really afraid. So, Daddy, make me do it. Make me do it. He was saying, look, I know I'm going to have a great time, but I know when I see the waves, I see the water, I'm not going to want to do it. God, make me do it. And dear friend, as we take a step into the dark, the question is, what is your next step? For some of you, it's baptism. For others, it's reading the Bible. For others, it's a relationship that you have with a person. You need to take the next step as far as how you treat them. For others, it's going to church more often or maybe even joining this church or a church. What is your next step? Because you see on the 1 to 10 scale, 1 being the baby and 10 being the mature Christian, it's not so much important where you are on that scale. What matters is where God wants you to be right now in your journey. And so are you taking the next steps in the journey? And perhaps this morning, your next step, as you've been sitting here, your next step is to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. To take that first step of trust with him. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if that is the prayer of your heart, I ask you right now to pray this prayer with me. Silently as I pray aloud, asking Jesus to come into your heart. And the prayer goes like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for going to the cross and dying for my sins. I open up the door of my heart, Lord, and I ask you to come in. Forgive me of all my sin. I trust you as Savior and Lord of my life. In Jesus' name.